been a long evening. Uh, our organization did submit to you a memorandum summarizing our many previous comments, uh, focusing on 14 key points uh, that we thought were worth revisiting. We are not tonight going to go through those 14 points, which largely deal with current legal and policy matters before you. Um, I do hope you'll all have a chance to look at that. What I'd like to do instead, and Peter is he's going to do as well, is talk a little bit about the context of this whole decision. Uh, going back more than 40 years, citizens and some officials of the city of Hudson have been working, struggling, fighting in some cases to preserve the opportunity of our waterfront, to bring us to this point where we still have a choice about what type of waterfront we could have. And so the decision before this board, as I see it, is not just about the narrow particulars of their application, but it's really about the decades that citizens of this town have put into creating the waterfront we have, preserving this opportunity, and deciding where are we going to be in another 40 years. So let me get right into it, because again, it has been a long night. I'm going to start in 1976 when the Atlas Cement Plant uh, which sprawled over both Greenport and Hudson closed. Uh, all their activity at the waterfront ceased. Uh, that was a company that, contrary to a lot of local lore, never really operated continuously for more than about 15 to 25 years. They had the longest strike in their national company history right here in Hudson, led by a guy named Al Cook, may he rest in peace, uh, who eventually became a great ally of ours. He was the union chief at Atlas Cement, helped us stop the St. Lawrence Cement Project that I'll talk about in a moment. So that was 1976. I don't know if it was a coincidence or if it was intended, but in 1977, Columbia County Planning obtained a federal grant to study land use throughout the county focusing on the River Corridor. And they uh, focused on, on a number of areas, but in particular on the South Bay waterfront area. And what they determined was that the South Bay had for many years been what they call the use conflict. It's a very dull term. But essentially, what it boiled down to was that heavy industry had been at odds with public access to the river, to siting other businesses, smaller businesses, uh, focused on uh, allowing people to use the river, like boat rentals or marine supplies, uh, as well as just ecological uh, uh, use uh, improvements and uh, people used to trap and hunt in the South Bay, certainly fish. And I'll provide the board with all these slides so I won't read all the text on them. But they were kind of stunningly frank in 1977, more so than people usually are in planning documents now, uh, where they basically said the city needs to choose. Either you should completely reindustrialize your waterfront or you should completely remove heavy industry from your waterfront. And the reason they said that it was an either or is due to the compact nature of the Hudson waterfront. Mm -hmm. We don't have a situation like some cities where you can put the gravel at one end and the public park a mile away. Here, they're right next to each other. It's a wonderful resource, but it is a very compact waterfront where every piece affects another. In 1982, the L&D factory, which now houses uh, the CNC uh, shop, brewery, and, and many other stores, uh, was built over a great deal of public opposition, mainly from sportsmen <coughs> who hunted and trapped, as I said, in the South Bay and were opposing the project. And the city made a compromise with those sportsmen. And you can find it in the minutes of the Common Council of 1982, where they basically said, okay, if you let us build L&D, there will be no further development south of L&B in South Bay. Now, it was a resolution, not a local law, but it tells you where the Common Council's head was in 1982. Jumping forward to 1985-86, and you might recognize a face here. Uh, the, wow. head of, the head of the planning board, <laughs> the head of the planning board and HTC, and someone can correct me if I get any of this wrong, uh, decided to go with the let's industrialize everything route and embraced a proposal for a waste oil refinery at the waterfront. The dates are wrong. 
They're wrong, what are they? The date should be 82 to 85. Okay, 82 to 85. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. I thought I asked you about that. Anyway, um, uh, 82 to 85. Uh, and save Hudson's only waterfront, or show, I guess, uh, uh, organized against this. If you read the newspaper articles of the day, uh, as well as uh, a great article that you can find in the archives of Hudson Valley Magazine, the amount of abuse that citizens received from public officials just for questioning the wisdom of this was truly unbelievable. And, uh, but the citizens uh, did weather that storm and stopped it. I believe it was actually a Russian-owned oil refinery, even better. Um, and they saved Hudson from this tremendous, tremendous mistake. I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. Going forward a decade from 85, in 1996, the Hudson Opera House, uh, working with a firm called Cavendish, uh, engaged in a lengthy planning process called the Hudson Vision Plan. I arrived here just a couple years afterwards, and people were still buzzing about this process, saying it was really one of the greatest things that happened in Hudson, the number of people who came out at the participation. And uh, this image, there used to be a, a very big version of this in Charlie Butterworth's office. I don't know if the current city engineer has it, but uh, maybe the planning board could find it. But it's hard to read here. But this was a visualization that Cavendish did about the waterfront, uh, focusing primarily on the land that the city already owned. Um, but it was a mix of shops, marinas, uh, again, marine supply, some restaurants, you know, bait shops, you name it. Um, and that, even though it was sponsored by the Opera House, it essentially became an official city plan, although some local officials weren't totally happy about it. Um, and it became referenced by people like the Secretary of State, who will talk about it in a minute, when he decided on St. Lawrence Cement. In 1999, a fly-by-night Canadian company proposed to truck all the dry cleaning waste in the Northeast, <laughs> primarily from New York City, but all over the New York Northeast, down through the city streets to dump it in what is now the Basilica. At that time, it was an abandoned glue factory. And we were told that they were going to make uh, poly bags and hangers for the dry cleaning industry. I used a new tool called Google that I just learned about and found out that, in fact, they're a, they're a toxic waste pro uh, processing company. They claimed to have a patent pending technology that would neutralize the waste, but they couldn't remember when we finally forced the mayor to bring them to town. They couldn't remember where the pilot plant was. And the hearing became such a debacle. Some of you were here. Uh, there's a videotape of that hearing. I think Linda has it. Um, uh, the hearing became such a debacle that the city leaders had to abandon it. 2001 and 2002, there was another round of grant writing by the city. Our uh, God help us, Congressman John Sweeney assisted the city with uh, getting grants to really upgrade uh, what had already been started by previous administrations on what is now the Henry Hudson Waterfront Park. But this was a very degraded area um, for many, many years. If you go back to the movie, two, uh, not two square miles, uh, Odds Against Tomorrow, you can see a little bit of what that looked like in the 1950s. Around the same time, and, and I will get to the cement fight which was going on at this time, the city also uh, enacted a comprehensive plan. And uh, some of us in this room were on the steering committee for that. Uh, there was a great deal of controversy over the plan, a uh, tremendous amount of public uh, input again. But one of the things that was done was that the planners, who were also the planners as it happened for St. Lawrence Cement, circulated a uh, a questionnaire about waterfront, the waterfront and what do people want down there. And there's a condensed version of the whole uh, table, which we've already submitted to you. But the public's top priority was parks, recreation, and open space at the waterfront. Their lowest priority was, by a mile, was having more heavy industry down there. So between 1998 and 2005, you'll see some faces in the room here, a few of us. Uh, looking a little older today. Uh, but the, the St. Lawrence Cement proposal raged in town. It was a, it seemed like a never-ending controversy. And, uh, but ultimately, the citizens won what was considered a complete against-the-odds battle. And the 
the really relevant part, and, and again, that facility would have had both a massive shipping operation at the waterfront, as well as a, a giant manufacturing plant up on the mountain. But the interesting thing for our purposes today is that the Secretary of State, Randy Daniels, who you see here, not only said, I've looked at the vision plan, I've looked at the comprehensive plan, and I've seen what's going on in Hudson and where its economy lies. And it was really a, a decision as much based in economic considerations as environmental ones. He went beyond just saying, St. Lawrence, you can't build your giant coal-fired facility or put a huge conveyor belt through the bay. They had a lot of trucks involved too, actually. Um, but he said, here's how you should immediately rezone your waterfront. He listed prohibited uses, permitted uses, and conditional uses in his decision. What he, what he saw as the best way forward for Hudson to benefit all the citizens. Um, again, I'm not gonna read all the text, you all have been here quite long, a long time, but prohibited uses should include, the Secretary of State, second highest ranking <coughs> official in our state, said prohibited uses should include manufacturing, assembling, storing and processing products or facilities, outdoor storage of lumber, construction and building materials, gravel, contractors, equipment, trucks, etc. Sam, yeah. what is the context for him saying that? Is that, is that, is that it was a coastal consistency determination that he made. Uh, it was one of the 17 permits and approvals, 18 permits and approvals I used to know that St. Lawrence needed to get to build the project. And uh, the state has a series of uh, coastal policies. Uh, there's 44 of them, or at least there were then. Uh, Jeff would certainly know. Um, is that and guidance to the city, or is that a directive? No, they had to, um, as what Sam was saying, some of their approvals that they needed required a coastal zone consistency determination from the state, the federal permits and the state permits. And so they had to make a determination and it's a long story as to why they made it when they did, but um, they basically said, no, you don't meet the criteria because the activities on the waterfront that proposed the St. Lawrence would conflict with a variety of different policies, and so they denied the coastal zone consistency. St. Lawrence could have appealed that decision, but they just denied the project. And um, they, they, uh, they, at that point, had spent $60 million, and we've been working pretty hard on their board to get them to give up the ghost, and they did. But an interesting thing about coastal policies, as I understood them at the time at least, is that it's not a balancing act. If you if you can meet 43 of them, but you fail on one of them, you don't pass the test. And they, they, there were, I think, three or four main policies that the state focused on. So immediately after that, the city did act on the, the uh, uh, Secretary of State's um, recommendations after a fashion. They set up a Waterfront Advisory Steering Committee. Some of us are in the room, at least two of us. And uh, one of the things we did was so we sent out surveys, mailed them out. Uh, I don't think there were online surveys or services really available at the time. I think we got three or four hundred of them. I tabulated them on a computer with uh, Gita Chetty. And we basically used as options for people all the things that were mentioned in the Secretary of State's decision to see if the people of Hudson actually agreed with them. And lo and behold, they did. The, their lowest rated activities were trucking, storage, and other heavy industrial uses, their highest rate activities were open space, recreation, uh, like commercial activity, and the like. That process, I'm not going to get into everything that happened there, but concluded in, in 2011. Uh, many of us were not very happy with the outcome of that process. Uh, we felt that the city had ample grounds to, uh, to immediately sunset uh, the trucking activity that St. Lawrence's uh, parent company, Wholesome, had started in 2006 after they lost without any permits, without any kind of uh, uh, assessment of them introducing this completely new use. Um, but some good things came of it, lo and behold. And as Ken Dow said earlier, if you listen to the audio of uh, William Sharp, Bill Sharp from the Department of State, at the hearing where this was voted on, he lays out very exactly how this conditional use permit process that was, that was put in place would work. He says if they do anything to the road, to the dock, they're gonna have to come back and start over as if from new. And as I learned about Seeker uh, from working with 
various attorneys, there's always the possibility of a board being able to say, well, we've looked at your, your application and we've thought about mitigations, but we don't think the impacts of this project can be adequately mitigated. And so we're going to go with the, what you might call the no-build alternative. And that alternative always has to be considered under Seeker, as I understand it, the possibility that you're not going to do anything. Sam, could we do two yeah. minutes? Yes. And Peter needs a shot as well. Um, I'll try to hurry it up. Yeah. In 2012, citizens again organized to give input to the state. Uh, and the state agreed, uh, did decide to designate the South Bay Creek and Marsh as a protected coastal fish and wildlife habitat. What that means is if this project goes to Seeker, they have to uh, show that they are compliant with that designation. That process has not started yet, but I do not believe it is optional. 2013, Valley Alliance first brought out its research showing that the city had improperly alienated four, four acres, alienated being a tricky term for basically sold, 4.4 uh, acres without getting the necessary legislative approvals from the state, and that the city still owned it. The council president and mayor ordered a title company to review our lawyer's analysis of that. The title company said, you don't need anything further from me. The lawyer is correct. And Don Moore, the then council president, announced, we do own it. Nevertheless, bizarrely, seven years later, the city is still not acting to take back its own land. 2017, I've got two more slides, I think. Um, the DERI funding was, was awarded largely for waterfront uh, projects, and as I understand it, this is really intended as seed money for another 40 to $60 million in investment. Finally, 2019, the Malconian ruling, which has been the subject of plenty of discussion tonight, and uh, I won't go through it again. It is an, a non-conforming use that is now ungrandfathered, and the planning board has the right to review it as if it was a brand new project. And with that, can we please give Peter a chance since I've paused the limelight yeah. so much here? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, happy to answer questions about any of that. Slide up. Oh, I've got some other slides. Good evening. Um, I'm Peter Downing, uh, one of the other directors of the Valley Alliance. Welcome to the new members. Uh, I served on the board under Mayor Dick Tracy. Remember those days? 20 some years ago. And we never had anything this complex come before us. It was mostly where can you put the photo, John, and stuff like that. Uh, so in any case, I just, I'll just i keep it really short because I know we've all been here too long this evening. Um, my main agenda this evening is to encourage the board to view this in the most holistic way possible. So you don't get trapped into this thing of wondering about how many pebbles of gravel are going to go into a truck or exactly how many uh, grams of particulate matter are going to be sent up the diesel smokestack. That sort of information is critical, and of course you're going to review it. But I would really encourage the board to take a broader look and think about what kind of waterfront we want to have when we're all done. <coughs> there are two large considerations ongoing contemporaneously with this review. One is the LWRP. That, that acronym, if you're not familiar, is Local Waterfront Revitalization Plan. Sometime in the 1990s, <clears throat> there was a recognition that all over the country are these old, tired, polluted waterfronts that could potentially be freshened up, improved, and turned into recreational resources for the community and also uh, hopefully generate jobs and tax revenue. So that program is de delegated down from the federal uh, program in Washington. It is administrated by local officials, and in our case, the state of New York's Department of State. It's a wonderful program. Hudson is almost there. It's about 95% done. Um, the work was completed, I think, back in 2011. Um, and for one reason or another, which we don't need to discuss this evening, it has languished and has not received that final approval from the state of New York. When it is approved, um, it's tremendously helpful to our community in many respects. <clears throat> we would become eligible for grants. 
we become eligible for technical consistent uh, technical consulting and assistance. We would establish what's called a coastal consistency committee, which would give input to the to the city and to the various agencies of the city as to whether a proposed development is consistent uh, with the coastal zone. So that LWRP is really close. I think what needs to happen is the committee needs to be put back together. They need to work closely with the Department of State and hopefully our new mayor and our, our new administration and get it done. We started this in 1985. <laughs> what is that? 35 years. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> um, so let's get the LWRP done. Now, the LWRP is effectively the master plan for the waterfront. So we're in this kind of ridiculous, out of sequence posture where we're entertaining a very large industrial proposition before we finish the master plan for the waterfront. It's ass backwards, if I can say that in public. Um, the other big consideration is the DRI. <clears throat> the DRI grant, as you're all aware, came down from the Cuomo administration. I served on that committee, along with Betsy Gramko, who's not with us this evening. <clears throat> that 10 million bucks is only the seed money for what is supposed to attract a lot more uh, development. And that, hopefully, the scenario is that it will ultimately attract 40, 50, 60 million dollars of private investment into our waterfront zone. So that could manifest itself in the form of housing, retail, you know, there are endless possibilities. And the city has engaged the Chazen group uh, to help facilitate that process. And my impression of them is that they're pretty good and they're going to they're gonna come to town and help us get that done. Peter, one more minute. Okay. Yep. Uh, so uh, my, my plea to the board would be, don't make this decision on this Hollywood application on a small and narrow technical considerations, but rather think of it in the broadest, holistic way possible. Okay, thanks.